Account of the Chickasaw Nation By James Adair, the Chickasaw country lies in about 35 degree. N.L. At the distance of 160 miles from the eastern side of the Mississippi, 160 miles to the end. Of the Choctaw, according to the course of the trading path, about halfway from Mobile to the Illinois, from south to north to the west. Northwest. Of the Muscogee, creeks, about 300 computed miles, and a very mountainous winding path from the Chirag nearly W. About 540 miles, the late Fort Loudon is by water 500 miles to the Chicasa landing place, but only 95 computed miles by land. The Chicasa are now settled between the heads of two of the most western branches of Mobile River and within 12 miles of the eastern main source of Tar Hatch, which lower down is called Chakchuma River, as that nation made their first settlements there after they came on the other side of the Mississippi. Where it empties into this, they call it Yasha River. The tradition says they had 10,000 men fit for war when they first came from the west, and this account seems very probable, as they, and the Chakta, and also the Chakchuma, who in process of time were forced by war to settle between the two former nations, came together from the west as one family. The Chikasa in the year 1720 had four large contiguous settlements, which lay nearly in the form of three parts of a square, only that the eastern side was five miles shorter than the western, with the open part toward the Chakta. One was called Yanika, about a mile wide and six miles long, at the distance of 12 miles from their present towns. Another was 10 computed miles long, at the like distance from their present settlements, and from one to two miles broad. The towns were called Chatera, Chukiraso, Haika, Tuscawillo, and Falakiho. The other square was single, began three miles from their present place of residence, and ran four miles in length and one mile in breadth. This was called Chukafara, or the Long House. It was more populous than their whole nation contains at present. The remains of this once formidable people make up the northern angle of that broken square. They now scarcely consist of 450 warriors and are settled three miles westward from the deep creek in a clear tract of rich land, about three miles square running afterward about five miles toward the end. W, where the old fields are usually a mile broad. The superior number of their enemies forced them to take into this narrow circle for social defense and to build their towns on commanding ground at such a convenient distance from one another as to have their enemies when attacked between two fires. Some of the old Nachi Indians who formerly lived on the Mississippi, 200 miles west of the Chacta, told me the French demanded from every one of their warriors a dreist buckskin without any value for it. I. E. They taxed them but that the warriors' hearts grew very cross and loved the deerskins. According to the French accounts of the Mississippi Indians, this seems to have been in the year 1729. As those Indians were of a peaceable and kindly disposition, numerous and warlike, and always kept a friendly intercourse with the Chikasa, who never had any goodwill to the French, these soon understood their heart burnings, and by the advice of the old English traders, carried them white pipes and tobacco in their own name and that of South Carolina, persuading them with earnestness and policy to cut off the French, as they were resolved to enslave them in their own beloved land. The Chikasa succeeded in their embassy. But as the Indians are slow in their councils on things of great importance, though equally close and intent, it was the following year before they could put their grand scheme in execution. Some of their headmen indeed opposed the plan, yet they never discovered it. But when these went a-hunting in the woods, the embers burst into a raging flame. They attacked the French, who were flourishing away in the greatest security, and, as was affirmed, they entirely cut off the garrison and neighboring settlements, consisting of 1,500 men, women, and children, the misconduct of a few indiscreet persons occasioned so great a number of innocent lives to be thus cut off. The Nachi afterward built and settled the strong stockade fort westward of their old fields, near a lake that communicates with Bayeux d'Argent, but the ensuing summer, near 2,000 French regulars and provincials, besides a great body of the Chakta and other savages, invested it. The besieged sallied on them, with the utmost fury, 
killed a considerable number, and in all probability would have totally destroyed the white soldiery, but for the sharp opposition of the Chakta in their own method of fighting. The Nachi were at length repulsed and bombarded with three mortars, which forced them to fly off different ways. The soldiers were too slow-footed to pursue, but the Chakta and other red allies captivated a great number of them and carried them to New Orleans, where several were burned and the rest sent as slaves to the West India Islands. The greater part, however, went to the Chikasa, where they were secured from the power of their French enemies. The French demanded them, but being absolutely refused, unluckily for many thousands of them, they formally declared war against the Chikasa. In the open fields the Chikasa bravely withstood and repelled the greatest combined armies they were able to bring against them, north and south, and gave them and their swarms of red allies several notable defeats. A body of the lower French and about 1400 Chakta attacked the Longhouse town when only 60 warriors were at home, yet they fought so desperately as to secure themselves, their women and children, till some of the hunters, who had been immediately sent for, came home to their assistance, when, though exceedingly inferior in number, they drove them off with great loss. Another time, the lower and upper Louisiana French and a great body of red auxiliaries surprised late at night all their present towns, except Amalata, that had about 40 warriors and which stood at some distance from the others. A considerable number of the enemy were posted at every door to prevent their escape and what few ran out were killed on the spot. The French seemed quite sure of their prey, having so well enclosed it. But at the dawn of day, when they were capering and using those flourishes that are peculiar to that volatile nation, the other town drew round them stark naked and painted all over red and black. Thus they attacked them, killed numbers on the spot, released their brethren, who joined them like enraged lions, increasing as they swept along, and in their turn encircled their enemies. Their release increased their joy and fury, and they rent the sky with their sounds. Their flashy enemies now changed their boasting tune into O Morbleu and gave up all for lost. Their red allies outhealed them and left them to receive their just fate. They were all cut off but two, an officer and a negro who faithfully held his horse till he mounted and then ran alongside of him. A couple of swift runners were sent after them, who soon came up with them, and told them to live and go home and inform their people that as the Chikasa hogs had now a plenty of ugly French carcasses to feed on till next year, they hoped then to have another visit from them and their red friends, and that, as messengers, they wished them safe home. They accordingly returned with heavy hearts to the Chikasa landing place in W. on the Mississippi, at the distance of 170 miles, where they took boat and delivered their unexpected message, grief and trembling spread through the country, and the inhabitants could not secure themselves from the fury of these warlike and enraged Chikasa. Every one of their prisoners was put to the fiery torture, without any possibility of redemption, their hearts were so exceedingly embittered against them. Flushed with this success, many parties turned out against the French, and from time to time hunted them far and near. Some went to the Mississippi, made a fleet of cypress bark canoes, watched their trading boats, and cut off many of them without saving any of the people. The French, finding it impracticable for a few boats to pass those red men of war, were obliged to go in a fleet, carry swivel guns in their long petty augers, with plenty of men, but always shunning the Chikasa side of the river and observing the strictest order in their movements by day and in their stations at night. The walking of a wild beast, I have been assured, has frequently called them to their arms and kept them awake for the whole night. They were in so great a dread of this warlike nation. The name of a Chikasa became as dreadful as it was hateful to their ears. And had it not been more owing to French policy than bravery in uniting all the Mississippi and Canada Indians in a confederacy and enmity against them, Louisiana settlements would have been long since either entirely destroyed or confined to garrisons. When any of the French armies made a tolerable retreat, they thought themselves very happy. Once, when the impression was pretty much worn out of their minds, and wine inspired them with new stratagems and hopes of better success, a great body of them, mixed with a multitude of savages, came to renew their attack. 
But as their hostile intentions were early discovered, the Chikasa had built a range of strong stockade forts on ground which could not safely be approached, as the contiguous land was low and chanced then to be wet. A number of the French and their allies drew near the western fort, but in the manner of hornets, flying about to prevent them, and as our traders had joined their friends by this time, they pulled out some and threw out other shells as near to the enemy as they possibly could. They soon found those dreadful phantoms were only common Frenchmen, covered with wool packs, which made their breasts invulnerable to all their well-aimed bullets. They now turned out of the fort, fell on, fired at their legs, brought down many of them and scalped them, and drove the others with considerable loss quite away to the southern hills, where the trembling army had posted themselves out of danger. In the midst of the night they decamped, and saved themselves by a well-timed retreat, left the Chikasa triumphant, and inspired them with the fierceness of so many tigers, which the French often fatally experienced, far and near, till the late session of West Florida to Great Britain. I have two of these shells, which I keep with veneration, as speaking trophies over the boasting messieurs, and their bloody schemes. In the year 1748, the French sent a party of their Indians to storm some of the Chikasa traders' houses. They accordingly came to my trading house first, as I lived in the frontier, finding it too dangerous to attempt to force it, they patted with their hands a considerable time on one of the doors, as a decoy, imitating the earnest rap of the young women who go a-visiting that time of night. Finding their labor in vain, one of them lifted a billet of wood, and struck the side of the house, where the women and children lay, so as to frighten them and awake me, my mastiffs had been silenced with their venison. At last, the leader went ahead with the beloved ark, and pretending to be directed by the divine oracle, to watch another principal trader's house, they accordingly made for it, when a young woman, having occasion to go out of the house, was shot with a bullet that entered behind one of her breasts and through the other, ranging the bone, she suddenly wheeled round, and tumbled down, within the threshold of the house. The brave trader instantly bounded up, sounding the war whoop, and in a moment grasped his gun, for the traitor's beds are always hung round with various arms of defense, and rescued her, the Indian physician also, by his skill and simples, soon cured her. As so much hath been already said of the Chikasa, in the accounts of the Chirik, Muskogee, and Chakta, with whose history theirs was necessarily interwoven, my brevity here, I hope will be excused. The Chikasa live in as happy a region as any under the sun. It is temperate, as cool in summer, as can be wished, and but moderately cold in winter. There is frost enough to purify the air, but not to chill the blood, and the snow does not lie four and twenty hours together. This extraordinary benefit is not from its situation to the equator, for the Chirik country among the Apollog Mountains is colder, in a surprising degree, but from the nature and levelness of the extensive circumjacent lands, which in general are very fertile. They have no running stream in their present settlement. In their old fields, they have banks of oyster shells at the distance of 400 miles from the seashore, which is a visible token of a general deluge when it swept away the loose earth from the mountains by the force of a tempestuous northeast wind and thus produced the fertile lands of the Mississippi, which probably was sea, before that dreadful event. As the Chikasa fought the French and their red allies with the utmost firmness and defense of their liberties and lands to the very last, without regarding their decay, only as an incentive to revenge their losses, equity and gratitude ought to induce us to be kind to our steady old friends and only purchase so much of their land as they would dispose of for value. With proper management, they would prove extremely serviceable to a British colony on the Mississippi. I hope no future misconduct will alienate their affections after the manner of the superintendent's late deputy, which hath been already mentioned. The skillful French could never confide in the Chakta, and we may depend on being forced to hold hot disputes with them in the infant state of the Mississippi settlements. It is wisdom to provide against the worst events that can be reasonably expected to happen. The remote inhabitants of our northern colonies are well acquainted with the great value of those lands from their observations on the spot. 
The soil and climate are fit for hemp, silk, indigo, wine, and many other valuable productions, which our merchants purchase from foreigners, sometimes at a considerable disadvantage. The range is so good for horses, cattle, and hogs that they would grow large and multiply fast without the least occasion of feeding them in winter, or at least for a long space of time. By reason of the numberless branches of reeds and canes that are interspersed with nuts of various kinds, rice, wheat, oats, barley, Indian corn, fruit trees, and kitchen plants would grow to admiration. As the ancients tell us, Bacchus Amat Montes, so grapevines must thrive extremely well on the hills of the Mississippi, for they are so rich as to produce winter canes, contrary to what is known at any distance to the northward. If British subjects could settle West Florida in security, it would in a few years become very valuable to Great Britain, and they would soon have as much profit as they could desire to reward their labor. Here, 500 families would in all probability be more beneficial to our mother country than the whole colony of North Carolina, besides innumerable branches toward Ohio and Monongahela. Enemies to the public good may enter caveats against our settling where the navigation is precarious, and the extraordinary kindness of the late ministry to the French and Spaniards prevented our having an exclusive navigation on the Mississippi. Aberville might still become a valuable mark to us, and from New Orleans it is only three miles to St. John's Creek, where people pass through the Lake of St. Louis and embark for Mobile and Pensacola. The Spaniards have wisely taken the advantage of our misconduct, by fortifying Louisiana and employing the French to conciliate the affections of the savages, while our legislators, fermented with the corrupt lees of false power, are striving to whip us with scorpions. As all the Florida Indians are grown jealous of us since we settled E. N. W. Florida, and are unacquainted with the great power of the Spaniards in South America, and have the French to polish their rough Indian politics, Louisiana is likely to prove more beneficial to them than it did to the French. They are fortifying their Mississippi settlements like a new Flanders, and their French artists, on account of our ministerial lethargy, will have a good opportunity, if an European war should commence, to continue our valuable western barriers as wild and waste as the French left them. The warlike Chicasa proved so formidable to them that, except a small settlement above New Orleans, which was covered by the Chacta Bounds, they did not attempt to make any other on the eastern side of the Mississippi, below the Illinois, though it contained such a vast tract of fine land as would be sufficient for four colonies of 250 miles square. Had they been able by their united efforts to have destroyed the Chicasa, they would not have been idle, for, in that case, the Chacta would have been soon swallowed up by the assistance of their other allies, as they never supplied them with arms and ammunition, except those who went to war against the Chicasa. From North Carolina to the Mississippi, the land near the sea is, in general, low and sandy, and it is very much so in the two colonies of Florida, to a considerable extent from the seashore, when the lands appear fertile, level, and diversified with hills. Trees indicate the goodness or badness of land. Pine trees grow on sandy, barren ground, which produces long coarse grass. The adjacent lowlands abound with canes, reeds, or bay and laurel of various sorts, which are shaded with large expanding trees. They compose an evergreen thicket, mostly impenetrable to the beams of the sun, where the horses, deer, and cattle chiefly feed during the winter, and the panthers, bears, wolves, wild cats, and foxes resort there, both for the sake of prey and a cover from the hunters. Lands of a loose black soil, such as those of the Mississippi, are covered with fine grass and herbage, and well shaded with large and high trees of hickory, ash, white, red, and black oaks, great towering poplars, black walnut trees, sassafras, and vines. The low wetlands adjoining the rivers chiefly yield cypress trees, which are very large and of a prodigious height. On the dry grounds is plenty of beech, maple, holly, the cotton tree, with a prodigious variety of other sorts. But we must not omit the black mulberry tree, which, likewise, is plenty. It is high, and, if it had proper air and sunshine, the boughs would be very spreading. On the fruit, the bears and wild fowl feed during their season, and also swarms of paraquets, enough to deafen one with their chattering in the time of those joyful repasts. 
I believe the white mulberry tree does not grow spontaneously in North America. On the hills, there is plenty of chestnut trees and chestnut oaks. These yield the largest sort of acorns, but wet weather soon spoils them. In winter, the deer and bears fatten themselves on various kinds of nuts, which lie thick over the rich land, if the blossoms have not been blasted by the northeast winds. The wild turkeys live on the small red acorns and grow so fat in March that they cannot fly farther than three or four hundred yards, and not being able soon to take the wing again, we speedily run them down with our horses and hunt. Indians use this, or the sassafras, for posts to their houses as they last for generations and the worms never take them. Chinkapins are very plenty of the taste of chestnuts, but much less in size. There are several sorts of very wholesome and pleasant tasted ground nuts, which few of our colonists know anything of. In wetland, there is an aromatic red spice and a sort of cinnamon, which the natives seldom use. The yopon, or casina, is very plenty as far as the salt air reaches over the lowlands. It is well tasted and very agreeable to those who accustom themselves to use it instead of having any noxious quality according to what many have experienced of the East India insipid and costly tea. It is friendly to the human system, enters into a contest with the peccant humors, and expels them through the various channels of nature. It perfectly cures a tremor in the nerves. The North American tea has a pleasant aromatic taste and the very same salubrious property as the casina. It is an evergreen and grows on hills. The bushes are about a foot high, each of them containing in winter a small aromatic red berry in the middle of the stalk, such I saw it about Christmas when hunting among the mountains opposite to the lower Mohawk castle in the time of a deep snow. There is no visible decay of the leaf, and October seems to be the proper time to gather it. The early buds of sassafras and the leaves of ginseng make a most excellent tea, equally pleasant to the taste and conducive to health. The Chinese have sense enough to sell their innervating and slow poisoning teas under various fine titles while they themselves prefer ginseng leaves. Each of our colonies abounds with ginseng. Among the hills that lie far from the C-96 settlement is the lowest place where I have seen it grow in South Carolina. It is very plenty on the fertile parts of the Chirig Mountains. It resembles Angelica, which in most places is also plenty. Its leaves are of a darker green, and about a foot and half from the root, the stalk sends out three equal branches, in the center of which a small berry grows, of a red color, in August. The seeds are very strong and agreeable aromatic. It is plenty in West Florida. The Indians use it on religious occasions. It is a great loss to a valuable branch of trade that our people neither gather it in a proper season nor can cure it so as to give it a clear shining color like the Chinese tea. I presume it does not turn out well to our American traders for up the Mohawk River, a gentleman who had purchased a large quantity of it told me that a skipple or three bushels cost him only nine shillings of New York currency and in Charlestown, an inhabitant of the upper Yadkin settlements in North Carolina who came down with me from viewing the Natchee old fields on the Mississippi, assured me he could not get from any of the South Carolina merchants one shilling sterling a pound for it, though his people brought it from the Allegheny and Appalock Mountains 200 miles to Charlestown. It would be a service worthy of a public-spirited gentleman to inform us how to preserve the ginseng so as to give it a proper color, for could we once affect that, it must become a valuable branch of trade. It is an exceeding good stomachic and greatly supports nature against hunger and thirst. It is likewise beneficial against asthmatic complaints, and it may be said to promote fertility in women, as much as the East India tea causes sterility in proportion to the baneful use that is made of it. A learned physician and botanist assured me that the eastern teas are slow but sure poison in our American climates and that he generally used the ginseng very successfully in clusters to those who had destroyed their health by that dangerous habit. I advised my friend to write a treatise on its medical virtues and the posterior application as it must redound much to the public good. He told me it would be needless, for quacks could gain nothing from the best directions, and that already several of his acquaintance of the faculty mostly pursued his practice in curing their patients. 
The Eastern tea is as much inferior to our American teas and its nourishing quality as their album Greekum is to our pure venison from which we here sometimes collect it. Let us, therefore, like frugal and wise people, use our own valuable aromatic tea and thus induce our British brethren to imitate our pleasant and healthy regimen, showing the utmost indifference to any duties the statesmen of Great Britain and their assumed prerogative may think proper to lay on their East India. Poisoning and Dearbought Teas The industry of the uncorrupt part of the Indians, in general, and of the Chikasa, in particular, extends no farther than to support a plain simple life and secure themselves from the power of the enemy and from hunger and cold. Indeed, most of them are of late grown fond of the ornaments of life, of raising livestock, and using a greater industry than formerly to increase wealth. This is to be ascribed to their long intercourse with us and the familiar easy way in which our traders live with them, begetting imperceptibly an emulous spirit of imitation according to the usual progress of human life. Such a disposition is a great advance towards their being civilized, which certainly must be effected before we can reasonably expect to be able to bring them to the true principles of Christianity. Instead of reforming the Indians, the monks and friars corrupted their morals, for, in the place of inculcating love, peace, and goodwill to their red pupils, as became messengers of the divine author of peace, they only impressed their flexible minds with an implacable hatred against every British subject, without any distinction. Our people will soon discover the bad policy of the late Quebec Act, and it is to be hoped that Great Britain will in due time send those black crooking clerical frogs of Canada home to their infallible mufti of Rome. I must here beg leave to be indulged, and a few observations on our own American missionaries. Many evils are produced by sending out ignorant and wicked persons as clergymen. Of the few I know, two among them dare not venture on repeating but a few collects in the common prayer. A heathen could say, If thou wouldst have me weep, thou must first weep thyself, and how is it possible we should be able to make good impressions on others, unless they are first visible on ourselves? The very rudiments of learning, not to say of religion, are wanting in several of our missionary evangelists. The best apology I have heard in their behalf is, an English nobleman asked a certain bishop why he conferred holy orders on such a parcel of errant blockheads. He replied, because it was better to have the ground plowed by asses than leave it a waste full of thistles. It seems very surprising that those who are invested with the power of conferring ecclesiastical orders should be so careless in propagating the holy gospel and assiduous to profane holy things and appointing and ordaining illiterate and irreligious persons to the service. What is it? But saying, go teach the American fools. My blessing is enough. Cherish confidence, and depend upon it, they will not have confidence to laugh at you, leave the remote and poor settlements to the care of divine providence, which is diffusive of its rich gifts. The harvest is great elsewhere. Only endeavor to episcopize the northern colonies, it is enough, there they are numerous, and able to pay Peter's pence, as well as our old Jewish and new parliamentary tithes, and in time your labors will be crowned with success. That court, however, which sends abroad stupid ambassadors to represent it, cannot be reasonably expected to have success, but rather shame and derision. What can we think at this distance, when we see the number of blind guides our spiritual fathers at home have sent to us to lead us clear of the mazes of error? But that they think of us with indifference and are studiously bent on their own temporal interest instead of our spiritual welfare. There are thousands of the Americans who I believe have not heard six sermons for the space of above thirty years, and in fact they have more knowledge than the teachers who are sent to them, and too much religion to communicate with them. And even the blinder sort of the laity not finding truth sufficiently supported by their purblind guides, grow proud of their own imaginary knowledge, and some thereby proudly commence teachers, by which means they rend the church asunder, and, instead of peace and love, they plant envy, contempt, hatred, revilings, and produce the works of the flesh, instead of those of the spirit. Not so act the uncivilized Indians. Their supposed holy orders are obtained from a close attention to and approved knowledge of their sacred mysteries. No temptations can corrupt their virtue on that head, neither will they convey their divine secrets to the known impure. 
This conduct is worthy to be copied by all who pretend to any religion at all, and especially by those who are honored with the pontifical dignity, and assume the name of right reverend and most reverend fathers in God. I have been importunately requested at different times by several eminent gentlemen who wish well to both church and state to represent the evils resulting from such missionaries in hope of redress, and on this occasion I thought it criminal to refuse their virtuous request. The representation is true, and the writer is persuaded he cannot give the least offense by it to any but the guilty. My situation does not allow me to fix the bounds our legislators claim on the Mississippi, but I have good reason to believe that the fine court title which France, in her late dying will, has transferred to great productions are suitable to so fine a soil and climate, besides great quantities of beef, pork, and every kind of useful timber for Jamaica, which is contiguous to the mouth of the Mississippi. So great an acquisition of raw materials would soon prove very beneficial to Great Britain, as well as a great safeguard to the best part of our other colonies, and a very needful check to Spanish insolence. Such a material undertaking, as the colonizing of so important a barrier, deserves public encouragement to put it in a fair way of doing well, and the continuance of a supply, and protection through its infant state, to secure it from any artful attempts the Spaniards and their French subjects might plot to disturb its tranquility, and thereby check its growth. There might be introduced even among the Indian nations I have described, a spirit of industry, in cultivating such productions as would agree with their land and climates, especially if the superintendency of our Indian affairs, westward, was conferred on the sensible, public-spirited, and judicious Mr. George Galfin, Merchant, or Lachlan Gilray, ESQ, of equal merit. Every Indian trader knows from long experience that both these gentlemen have a greater influence over the dangerous Muscogee than any others besides. And the security of Georgia requires one or other of them speedily to superintend our Indian affairs. It was, chiefly, the skillful management of these worthy patriots which prevented the Muscogee from joining the Chirake, according to treaty, against us in the years 1760 and 1761, to their great expense and hazard of life, as they allowed those savages to eat, drink, and sleep at Silver Bluff, below New Windsor Garrison, and at Augusta 15 miles apart, and about 150 miles from Savannah. I write from my own knowledge, for I was then on the spot, with a captain's commission from South Carolina. A Muscogee war against us could easily be prevented by either of those gentlemen, if chosen, and the destructive plan of general licenses was repealed. It is to be hoped that they who are invested with the power will retract their former error and have the pleasure of knowing the good effect it would produce by giving an opportunity of civilizing and reforming the savages, which can never be affected by the former usual means. Admit into Indian countries a sufficient number of discreet orderly traders. This needful regulation will likewise benefit trade, which is almost ruined, and our valuable weak frontier colonies would thereby increase in numbers, proportionable to their security. Formerly, each trader had a license for two towns, or villages, but according to the present unwise plan, two, and even three Arab-like peddlers skulk about in one of those villages. Several of them also frequently emigrate into the woods with spirituous liquors and cheating trifles after the Indian hunting camps in the winter season to the great injury of a regular trader who supplies them with all the conveniences of hunting, for, as they will sell even their wearing shirt for inebriating liquors, they must be supplied anew in the fall of the year by the trader. At my first setting out among them, a number of traders who lived contiguous to each other, joined through our various nations in different companies, and were generally men of worth, of course, they would have a living price for their goods, which they carried on horseback to the remote Indian countries at very great expenses. These set an honest copy for the imitation of the natives, for as they had much at stake, their own interest and that of the government coincided. As the trade was in this wise manner kept up to its just standard, the savages were industrious and frugal. But, lowering it, through a mistaken notion of regaining their affections, we made ourselves too cheap to them, and they despised us for it. The trade ought to be raised to a reasonable fixed price, the first convenient opportunity, thus we shall keep them employed, and ourselves secure. 
Should we lower the trade, even 50% below the prime cost, they would become only the more discontented by thinking we had cheated them all the years past. A mean submissive temper can never manage our Indian affairs. The qualities of a kind friend, sensible speaker, and active brisk warrior must constitute the character of a superintendent. Great care ought to be taken not to give the Indians offense or a mean opinion of the people or government our Indian superintendents represent. At a general congress in Mobile, Anno 1765, where were present His Excellency the Learned, Cheerful, Patriotic Governor of West Florida, George Johnstone Esquire, the present superintendent of Indian affairs, and the headmen and warriors of the Chacta and warlike Chicasa nations, a tariff of trade was settled on every material article in the most public and solemn manner, mostly according to the Muscogee standard and to the great satisfaction of the Indians. The price for which the corrupt and shamefully indulged vagrant peddlers forced the traders at the risque of their lives to traffic with them, being then about 70% below the French tariff in Indian trade up the Mississippi. Each of these traders took out Indian trading licenses to which the fixed prices of various goods were annexed, thereby empowering them to traffic during the space of a 12-month, and they gave penal bonds of security to the 367 secretary for the just observance of their instructions. This proved, however, through a barefaced partiality, only a shameful farce on economy and good order. His Excellency and the Honorable Colonel W. N. were so strongly convinced of my former integrity that in order to testify publicly their approbation of my good conduct, they did me the honor to pass security in the secretary's office for my dealing with the Indians in strict conformity to the laws of trade. As I lost in the space of a year, to the amount of two and twenty hundred dollars worth of goods at prime cost, by the disorderly conduct of other licensed traders, and had just reason to hope for redress on exhibiting a well-supported complaint, I drew up on my own account, and at the importunate request of the Chicasa headman, a memorial, setting forth their having notoriously violated every essential part of their instructions, enticing the Indians also to get drunk, and then taught them to blaspheme their maker. This I proved, and that some of the lawless traders had furnished the Indians, in the space of a few months, with so great a quantity of prohibited liquors, as either did, or might enable some of them to decoy the savages to squander away thousands of dreyous deerskins, but they escaped with impunity. A few months before this period, some family disputes rose very high between the Chikasa on the following account. The Indians being ambitious, free, and jealous of their liberties, as well as independent of each other, where mutual consent is not obtained, one half of the nation were exceedingly displeased with the other, because, by the reiterated persuasions of a certain deputy, the latter had disposed of a tract of land, twelve miles toward the south, on the upper trading Chakta, or mobile path, to one of those disorderly traders. By the application of the deputy, the headmen of both parties met him according to appointment and partook of a plentiful barbecued feast with plenty of spirituous liquors. As such conduct was against his majesty's proclamation and appeared to me to be calculated either for a clandestine trade or family job, I rejected the invitation, lest otherwise I might be charged as a party. When they became intoxicated with liquor, a war leader of the dissenting party struck his tomahawk at the head of a noted chieftain, upbraiding him for bringing a strange fire into their land, but happily the blow missed its aim. The disputes consequently rose higher every day, and the 368 dissidents informed the Muscogee of their then situation and future intentions. Yaya Tustinich, the great mortar, a bitter enemy of the English, soon sent up a company of his war relations to persuade them to guard in time against our dangerous encroachments. By killing all the English that planted their lands without the general consent of the owners, and to take their black people as a good prize, because they were building and planting for the reception of an English garrison, which was to come from the Mississippi, and be the first means of enslaving them. While their transport of madness lasted, it was fruitless to reason with them, but at every convenient opportunity, I used such plain, friendly, and persuasive arguments to suit them, as I imagined might regain their lost affections, and procrastinate the dangerous impending blow. 
They consented at last to forbear every kind of resentment against our late suspicious conduct, on condition of my writing to those who could redress them, and our people speedily withdrawing from their land the intruding planters. This I did, and at Mobile I delivered my remonstrance to the superintendent. Upon my urging the absolute necessity of pacifying our old steady friends, by removing the ungenerous cause of their jealousy, he assured me that he would gladly comply with so just a request, especially as it exactly coincided with His Majesty's proclamation, then fixed on the fort gate. In the space of about ten days after, by order of Governor Johnstone, all the Chikasa and Chakta traders were cited to appear before him and the superintendent in order to know the merit of and answer to my numerous complaints. When they appeared and everything was properly adjusted, his secretary read paragraph by paragraph and His Excellency very minutely examined all the reputable traders who confirmed to his full satisfaction the truth of everything in my complaint. But though the below, we concluded by observing the great disadvantage of navigation that Mobile lay under, to which Charlestown was no way exposed in imports and exports, and that if the aforesaid Indian trade should, by any act be reduced below its present standard, it must necessarily cease of itself, unless as free men we said no to the command, which the traders did, and resolved to support it. The deputy's treatment of Captain James Colbert, who has lived among the Chikasa from his childhood, and speaks their language even with more propriety than the English, deserves to be recorded, but I hope the gentleman will soon do it himself, to show the higher powers the consequences of appointing improper, mercenary, and haughty persons to such offices. Sir William Johnson acted very differently, he was kind, intelligent, intrepid, he knew when to frown and when to smile on the Indian nations he was connected with and blended the serpent with the dove. He chose his deputies or representatives in the Indian countries according to their qualifications in the Indian life and not unskillful men and mere strangers like some who have been obtruded into our southern nations. His prudent and brave deputy colonel. Cragen did our chain of colonies more real service in a few months than all our late Southern Commissioners of Indian Affairs could possibly have done in ages. In the dangerous time of our settling the Illinois garrison, 500 leagues up the Mississippi, he went from Johnson's Hall, in the lower part of the Mohawk country, and from thence course through the various nations of Indians, to the head branches of Canada, and in like manner, down those of the Mississippi, to the garrison, amidst the greatest dangers, pleasing and reconciling the savages as he proceeded. The Chikasa first informed me of his journey and success, and I had it some time after, circumstantially confirmed to me by Sir W. Johnson. When I spoke to the colonel, himself on his fatigues and perils, he modestly replied that while he was performing the needful duties of his office and acting the part of a beloved man with the swan's wing, white pipe, and white beads, for the general good of his country and of its red neighbors, he had no leisure to think of any personal dangers that might befall a well-meaning peacemaker. Having reconciled the Cuscusque Indians, whom the French garrison had decoyed by their false painting of us, to remove with them over the Mississippi, he from thence proceeded down by water to New Orleans, afterwards, along the Gulf Stream of Mexico, to the place from whence he set off, amounting nearly to five thousand miles, in the oblique course he was forced to take. In brief, able superintendents of Indian affairs, and who will often visit the Indians, are the safest and strongest barrier garrisons of our colonies, and a proper number of prudent, honest traders dispersed among the savages would be better than all the soldiers, which the colonies support for their defense against them. The Indians are to be persuaded by friendly language, but nothing will terrify them to submit to what opposes their general idea of liberty. In the disputes between governors, superintendents, their deputies, and the traders, care should be taken to keep them very secret from the Indians, for they love such traders as are governed by principle and are easily influenced by them. Several agents of governors and superintendents have experienced this when dispatched into their countries to seize either the goods or persons of one and another trader, who was obnoxious by not putting the neck under their lordly feet. Some have hardly escaped from being tomahawked and cut to pieces on the spot by the enraged Indians for the violence offered to their friendly traders. 
When an Indian and trader contract friendship, they exchange the clothes then upon them, and afterwards they cherish it by mutual presence, and in general, will maintain it to the death. As early as 1736, the Georgia governor began to harass the licensed traders and sent a commissioner to seize the goods of several Carolinian traders and executing his commission, he was soon encircled by 23 Indians and would have been instantly dispatched, but for the intercession of one of the suffering traders, Mr. J. G. R. F. Tennis. When a governor of any of our colonies is either weak in his intellects or has self-interested pursuits in view, incompatible with the public good, he will first oppress the Indian traders and misrepresent all under his government who oppose him, and then adopt and pursue the low and tyrannical court maxim divide, and you will subdue and rule them. Whether the animosities that subsisted among the inhabitants of Georgia when Mr. Ellis went to preside there, sprung from any such cause, I will not say, but I well know that by his wisdom, cheerful and even temper, and an easy winning behavior, he soon reconciled the contending parties in his gay and friendly hall. The grateful and polite in that colony have taught their rising families to revere his name on account of his generous and patriotic spirit. He instructed the inhabitants of that infant colony, by example, how to fortify themselves against hostile dangers. The people were few, weak, harassed, and disheartened, but as soon as the father and general put to his helping hand, the drooping spirits recovered. Then, defensible garrisons sprung up, after the manner of ancient Thebes, but as he knew that peace with the numerous nations of neighboring Indians was essential to the welfare of a trading colony, he acted the part of the Archimagus, or great beloved man, with the swan's wing, white pipes, and tobacco, between the mischievous Muscogee and our colonies, at Savannah, in concert with the two worthy gentlemen before mentioned. At that time our Indian affairs in general wore a most dangerous aspect, and the public stock was expended, when the governor saw that he could not shake hands with the Indians, empty-handed, he cheerfully supplied their discontented headmen with his own effects, and even his domestic utensils. They set a high value on each gift, chiefly for the sake of the giver, whom they adopted as brother, friend, father. He gave the colony a strong example of public spirit by sacrificing his ease and private interest to the welfare of the people whom he faithfully patronized during his too short stay according to the paternal intentions of his late majesty. He was never ordered by his prince to inform the legislative body of the colony that, if the electors petitioned his majesty for the liberty of choosing representatives, he, through his own grace and goodness, would order his governor to inform them he was pleased to indulge them in the object of their submissive prayer. But had it been otherwise, Mr. Ellis would have deemed such a ministerial order a gross attack upon his honor, if not on the constitutional rights of British subjects, and have rejected it with contempt. When a gentleman of abilities employs his talents in his proper sphere in promoting the general good of society, instead of forwarding only his own interest, he is both an honor and a blessing to the community. The grateful public always reveres such a character and fail not to hand it down to the latest posterity to stimulate others to follow the example. Such was Mr. Ellison, Georgia, and such was the learned, wise, polite, affable, and now much lamented Sir Henry Moore Bart the late governor of New York Colony. His virtues so strongly endeared him to those he governed, and to everyone who had the pleasure of his acquaintance, that his memory will never be forgotten. He came to his government at the most confused time America ever knew. He found the senior member of the council strongly barricaded in the fort, but presently he ordered away the cannon and put a stop to other hostile preparations. He conversed with the people as a father. They were soon convinced of his upright intentions, and he lived triumphant in their hearts. If strict integrity, great abilities, and the most ardent desires and endeavors to promote the mutual interests of prince and people, if the most impartial administration of justice to every denomination of faithful subjects, if indefatigable application to public business, and a cheerfulness to redress every grievance that had the least tendency to affect the lives or property even of the meanest person. If these be the characteristics of one of the best of governors, our hearts feelingly testify, and the tears of a grateful people plainly showed, he enjoyed them in the most eminent degree. 
His stay, however, among them was but short, for having given a finished copy for others to pursue, heaven called him home to reward him for his shining virtues, and, though the other worthy patriot is in being, yet the honest sons of Georgia deeply lament his being lost to them. If you've been to this channel more than once, please subscribe, as it truly does help the channel. Leave a comment, for the bang looks forward to reading them and replying to them. Also, don't forget to like and share this content with like-minded individuals such as yourself. There is plenty more where this came from. Until next time, this bang content will end in 3, 2, 1.